That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Scary of 61st, the directorial debut of Daisha Nekrasova, which premiered at the 2021 uh, Berlin International Film Festival in the Encounters sidebar, where it received quite a bit of attention at the time. Uh, it is being released kind of in a trickling rollout uh effect, uh, courtesy of Utopia, and eventually it'll be available to stream on Shutter. It released in New York, I believe, December 3rd, and Los Angeles, theatrically, uh, December 17th, 2021. Okay, this movie is about two ladies, mm -hmm. a brunette and a blonde. Their names are Addie and Noelle. Addie is played by Betsy Brown, and Noelle is played by Madeline Quinn. Notably, Madeline Quinn is the co-writer on this film. Okay. They're like in their early 20s. They move into an apartment on the Upper East Side. The blonde has a boyfriend named Greg. Yep, played by Mark Rappaport, who is also a producer. So when they go to look at this apartment, um, the person showing it to them is not very nice. The, the apartment's fully furnished. It's filthy. At one point, the ladies ask, like, can this be cleaned? And he's like, yeah, right. So they spend the night. The next morning, we see the blonde go off to go see her boyfriend. And the brunette stays to, like, um, remove the linens from her bed. Well, there's an altercation between... They go shopping for linens, and there's an altercation between these friends that suggests that they kind of have a... Contentious relationship. Yes. So the blonde goes off with her boyfriend, the brunette goes home to change her linens, and when she removes the linens from her bed, she sees that the mattress is soiled. Like bodily fluids, blood, all that. While she's looking at that, someone knocks on the door, and it's someone saying they're a real estate agent. And that is the director herself, Daisha Nekrasova, who's, who's credited all... only as the girl. She's not given a character name. I'm going to call her the real estate agent, and she's a blonde as well, the director. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the director or the real estate agent says like I'm a uh like I need to check this apartment and like barges in. Mm -hmm. And when she barges in, she sees the filthy mattress and then starts vomiting. And then immediately says, "I'm not really a real estate agent. I'm doing um like 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 I'm investigating Jeffrey Epstein." She's part of an underground group that investigates these kind of things, apparently. And Jeffrey Epstein, as we know, is the convicted sex offender who killed himself out of, uh, I'm assuming, didn't want to deal with all the charges he was ultimately going to be convicted of. But uh, she very quickly convinces the brunette to, like, join her in, like, this investigation. Sleuthing. Which is amplified by them taking Vivans, which is, like, I think it's, like, close to Adderall. So they're like hopped up on speed like, or amphetamines, whatever, trying to uh, solve this case. And begin sleeping together. They're, they have a sexual encounter. The blonde... Addie. ...comes home and sees the two of them like there and she's kind of upset. Okay. To wrap this up, the blonde starts experiencing... Like she starts... It's almost like she's possessed and starts acting like a baby. To the point where, like, she's having sex with... Well, at one point, she has sex with her boyfriend, Greg, and is asking him to treat her like she's an underage girl. Like she's 13. And, of course, Greg is upset by that. Like, no, that's wrong. So they get into an argument. The blonde goes back to the apartment, and she's doing really odd things, like masturbating and with, like, pictures of Prince Andrew. Yeah, and, all this uh, royal family paraphernalia. But it's a pretty, like, violent uh, acts of, like masturbation because there's like blood involved okay then we see uh the now i'm forgetting what are you forgetting so what what it culminates as you it culminates say, with uh the, the girl uh daisha suggests to noelle that uh, they need to. We need to kill your friend. We need to get rid of your friend because she's vulnerable and weak, and that's why she's been a target for this supernatural occurrence. That's right. The real estate agent tells the brunette, "We should kill your roommate," and then they get into an altercation. No, and they're at a diner. Noelle leaves her, uh, and then we, for some, whatever reason, watch the girl go back to the apartment. Uh, she sees that something strange has happened in that apartment building, and she's shook about it. About it, like the pit, all these bloody royal family related objects goes into the basement and sees uh addy down there acting crazy addy hits her and knocks her out and as noelle come or as the girl comes to noelle barges in and like murders addy 
in a very bloody, gruesome sequence, goes back up to the apartment, sees the man that rented him there, suggesting that she is also possessed by some kind of supernatural spirit uh, involved well, in this. Well, so the blonde assaults the real estate agent, and the brunette kills the blonde. As I said, yes. Yeah, but then I wasn't using those names, so it's not clear. So then, yeah, they go back upstairs, and the brunette is killed, and the real estate agent finds a letter on a piano which had been played by the guy who showed them the apartment in the beginning of the film. I actually made you rewatch the end of this and you're still getting it wrong. She does assault Noelle, the brunette, as you're calling her, runs screaming into where, the point where she's dead in the apartment, she believes, runs out screaming down the street to where Greg is working at, as you called it, Mailboxes R Us or something, and convinces him to leave his post at work to come back with her to the apartment and they're the signs of everybody, all the death and carnage has been removed. And then she finds this letter on top of the piano that warns her. Okay. That's it. Yes. All right. Well, go through your notes. You don't have any notes on this? Well, you can go first. I was excited. Well, so this had a lot of buzz around it and people, you know, I missed watching it because uh, I cover primarily the competition films out of Berlin. Uh, and t as it started, I w was very much into the score and the vibe of the credit sequences. Uh, and it, and then it fall falls off a cliff soon after that. Um, it very much uh, feels like, of course, it's in correspondence to Polanski's apartment trilogy. Um, and somebody compared it to Eyes Wide Shut. It does not deserve that kind of a comparison. Or neither does it the Kaplansky films, but the popularity of those films and the influence they had, there were a lot of copycat films that came out. And this very much feels like one of those B-grade copycat films or a number of Giallo films from the 1970s. And a Nek, Nek Rosova seems to be kind of poking fun at that, but the, it, the tone is just all over the place. And although there are things I liked about the vibe, it feels very much like a student film. Like they didn't really have the resources to really get the tone right. And so it comes off feeling really tacky and like an exploitation film, much like uh, when Hilary Duff played Sharon Tate. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I, what, I, what I really wanted it to be like, because there, you can draw comparisons even to something like Last Night in Soho, which was a film I loathed recently by Edgar Wright. Uh, but even that seemed to make more sense than this. It's just so disjointed and all over the place. And I actually, since we watched it on the screener, had to go back and try to piece together, like, wait, why did that happen again? Because we watched this, like, four or five days ago now. And just, even as it sits with me, it just feels so dumb. Uh, and dumb can be fun, but this is not fun. But I really wanted it to be kind of like an old... Um, Val Luton film from the 40s called The Seventh Victim, where Kim Hunter plays this woman, I, I believe in New York, looking for her sister who's been absorbed by this cult. And I think it really could have had a lot of fun with that. But when we're dealing directly with Jeffrey Epstein, it just makes it seem like this needed a lot more finesse. Yeah. I mean, I don't have anything to add, actually. I mean, there's a, Kitty Green directed a film, I think last year, that's clearly dealing with Weinstein era sex, sexual offenses in the film industry, but doesn't actually name anybody. And you very much get what she's going for. And to me, that was a very classy affair. And I, I wanted this to be like that. You could, because they have somebody popping up that looks like Ghislaine Maxwell, and they say, that's Ghislaine. And it's like, well, I don't know. I, I particularly didn't like Nekrasova's performance. Because uh, the script isn't bad per se, it's just that all of the acting just, I, I was gritting my teeth sitting through it. And it feels like something that maybe was influenced by Joseph, like, like Josephine Decker seems to be kind of an influence on this. Another um, contemporary director who has really interesting ideas and sometimes the budget doesn't quite match what she's going for, although lately I, I think she's gotten better. Uh, but I was so kind of bored and irritated with this. I kept, what if this had been made in the 90s with Parker Posey starring as the real estate agent and Judy Greer and Winona Ryder as the roommates and all that weird lesbian sexual tension. And if it actually had something cohesive to say, I think it could be really interesting. Um, I did like how it looked. As I said, Hunter Zimney uh, was the cinematographer. And I liked the score by Eli Kiesler. Um, but uh, and if you notice, if you put it up side by side when you edit this, the poster art, which I do like, looks a, an awful lot like that horror film, The Stylist, 
that we reviewed. I think oh. was that earlier this year or last year. Yeah. I don't know. I just think it's very misleading. I'm kind of surprised at the reaction, except that I think that people are really hungry uh, for for this and nostalgic for this kind of method of filmmaking. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I I think it was tacky to. I just wish like. It just seems tacky to take like a real life sex offender <laughs> who had real victims and then do because the acting choices are deliberately bad. Like this shit is terrible, but it's on purpose, which I could appreciate if it weren't like, I don't know. I would just I feel like I'm, I'm surprised people think that this film is good. Yeah. Or, or was it just getting attention because it's not good? I don't know, but I can't recommend it. The only way I would recommend watching this film is with a group of people. To heckle it, to just to heckle it. But there are creepy moments. That, that I, I think it 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 sets up well enough. The part where she's pulling the uh, one, I can't believe these girls slept on this used bed. Uh, uh, where, where did you? Grow My up? very first note <laughs> is these bitches look nasty. Oh, so, so you I, do have notes. So I can believe that uh, they slept on the nasty ass sheets. But <laughs> but the point where she pulls it back and you see kind of this faded blood and all these body fluids. There are gross, creepy components to it. I just don't know what. F Epstein did, but what he was both convicted of in 2008 and what he was uh, standing, uh, charged with. Charged, being charged with, like, he did despicable enough things where we don't need the supernatural BS to go on, unless there's like a separate cult, like an element. It's just not well written enough. And it, it could be, it could be, the potential is there. What would you give it? I would give it one and a half out of five, which I think is generous. I would give it one out of five. Anything else? No. Bye.